My name is Ramsey and welcome to Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is a difficult turn-based tactical RPG that offers an infinite roguelike mode as well as a fully-fledged campaign, although that's not currently yet available in the early access build that I'm playing, focused primarily around ability deck building, roster management, cooperation, and turn-based gameplay. At this point in time, I would like to note that this is a series that has been sponsored by Gloomhaven and in particular Asmodee Digital, so thank you to them. But also as a result, I would like to note that this series should be considered an advertisement. It should be considered promotional material. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, Gloomhaven is based on one of the most well-designed board games, top-rated and award-winning. I've seen it on the top of Board Game Geek myself before, created by Isaac Childress. There will be, but are not yet at the moment, 17 playable characters, each with their own ability set for more than a thousand unique abilities to master. Multiple synergies are going to be present as a result of the diverse squads you can build from those 17 playable characters. And as for the enemies, there's more than 50 distinct enemies and bosses. All right, let's load up an adventure here. It's funny that I actually ended up getting offered the ability to do a sponsored series on this game because I already had this game on my wish list. It's one of the things that I'd already scouted out a very long time ago with Orbital to see if we could do it as a multiplayer series. And having a look at the main screen, I'm, I'm thinking that's possible uh, at some point in the future. But it's something that I'd scouted out for that, so I'm wildly pleased to see that I was also offered the ability to do a sponsored series for it. So there are a fair few different parties that we have access to here. Doom Crushers, Venom Stone, and the uh, Earth Brand. These aren't going to mean that much at the moment, but the four different characters that are in them are going to be pretty self-evident. So we've already got the Brute. I mean, do you need me to tell you what the Brute is? The Brute is the Brute class. Very tanky, that kind of thing. We've also got Cragheart, who has a little bit more of a like naturalistic focus, has a little bit more range in their abilities. Uh, as well as a little bit more healing than a lot of the other characters that I've encountered or had experience with so far. The Scoundrel is the rogue, the thief, etc. You know, you've all played some sort of an RPG before, I have to imagine. And if you haven't, you should probably try out an RPG. Sounds, uh, sounds like a good time. There's also the Spellweaver, which is more kind of like an elemental mage, sorcerer kind of class. These are the ones that we have access to at the moment. I have tested this out significantly in my own time so that I don't embarrass myself over the course of this series not knowing what anything is. And I found that Venom Stone is probably the build that I'm going to uh, want to run with. I kind of end up uh, treating Cragheart as my tank-ish. And then Scoundrel just rounds around doing almost all of the damage. I'm also going to be loading in... One second. I accidentally forgot to reset my party there. There we go. Okay, so I'm also going to be loading in on normal difficulty. I am currently the lowest experience I will ever be in this game. So I may as well pair that to the lowest difficulty that's currently on offer. Uh, peaceful, there are 25% fewer enemies. Blessed, heroes start each scenario with two plus blesses in their deck. We'll go into that in a moment. And healthy, Heroes also have 25% more health. All right. Welcome, mercenaries. While drinking at the Wayward Inn, you overhear snippets of conversation between two town militia. Apparently, a local bandit commander has come into possession of a number of heretical texts and has begun researching necromancy. So we can see our ultimate goal there to the south, the Bloodwatch Barons. You are well aware that magical research often requires a handy supply of gold, and after asking around, you discover his hideout's whereabouts. Obviously, you are unprepared to assault his base just yet, so you prepare to leave Wayward, the town in the center, and head off to raid some local crypts in search of knowledge and some better equipment. So we'll start our adventure. We have the choice of three different adventures that we can go on from this point. Those adventures are going to be spent kind of trying to build up our gold, trying to build up our stores and reserves of equipment, as well as level up our characters. All right. So I can choose a hard mission, an easy mission, or a medium mission. I'm going to go with the easy one. 
because the easy one is actually also uh, three scenarios in run length. So I'm actually still going to get pretty good rewards from it, despite the fact that it's also the easiest one here. So I'll plot a journey to the Burnt Tavern, and on the way, there's an armory where I've heard that a group of bandits train their archers. I've had an encounter on the road. Tired of traversing a tedious route through a dense forest, you contemplate taking a path straight through the maze of branches to shorten your journey time considerably. You notice a slight clearing behind the brush up ahead that could prove to be a shortcut through some dense forest. I'm going to try the potential shortcut. It would seem that you are not the first to have considered this route. Deep in the brambles, you spot some gear left behind by a previous adventurer. You take it and continue on through the forest clearing, pleased with your find. So you picked up a minor power potion during your turn to add a attack to your entire attack action. And I also appear to have some... A store that I could interact with at this point in time. That said, I have absolutely nothing that I can buy. I could sell Warhammers and stuff like that, but I don't know if I want to sell any of my starting equipment just so that I can start buying things there. Oh, right. That's because I clicked on Wayward. Okay, so I need to continue going over the armory. Hello? Armory? Can I go to you? Have I misunderstood something here? Am I no longer allowed to go to the armory? I suspect I may have encountered my first bug. <laughs> That's totally okay. We're literally just five seconds out of the gate, so I'm going to reset that. It is also worth noting at this point in time, as I noted earlier, this game is currently in early access, and therefore you cannot consider, or rather, you cannot consider. Uh, you should consider that the polish is not necessarily going to be representative of the final product or the product that you would be engaging with. That's standard pattern for my early access series as well. All right. Let's go to the Burnt Tavern. Ooh, no, that's only one length in scenario now. Hmm. We get a boot of dashing if we go in that way. Yeah, I still like boots of dashing. So we've got a lost catacombs, archers and cultists working together. For what ends? Let's travel to the destination. Hey, road encounter. I have nothing that I can do with this old well. You discover an old well on the side of the road. Some folk believe that dropping some coins in will grant good luck. I have nothing I can do there, so I'm just going to bounce and actually enter the catacombs. So now we can see the tactical role-playing level of the game. I'm going to choose where my characters start just for a moment. Uh, okay. My character doesn't have any defense of any kind. Mm hmm. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to set my thief up ready to kill this bone ranger off in this direction. And then the living corpse and cultists elite up in the top left are going to be more Kraghart's deal. So, having a look at this battle, we can see a couple of different things. We can see all of the scoundrels' different abilities over here on the left. We have a total of four, nine of them. To the left, you can see their initiative order. So you play two cards in a single turn. The card you play first, the initiative order on that determines ultimately the initiative of your character. So if I play a four and then a six, uh, so an 86, my initiative will be four. If I play an 86, then a four, my initiative will be 86. This is just so that you can decide whether you go earlier or later than other enemies, right? It gives you a little bit more influence over where your initiative is in the order. We can also have a look at the anatomy of a card. So this is a, this is a kind of standard card. You can see that there is an attack on one side and there's a movement option on the other. Now that doesn't necessarily always hold, but typically... The top will be an attack, the bottom will be a movement. Also, if you don't want to do that action, you can do a generic action instead. So the generic action for the attack here would just be attack for two, and the generic move would be move for two. This is in case you have something that, like throwing knives, doesn't actually move on what is quote-unquote the move half of the card. I'll just call it the bottom half of the card, though. What else about that immediately comes to mind that is important to mention? The two cards that you play, you play the top half of one of them exclusively and the bottom half of another. So if I play Flanking Strike and 
if I play Flanking Strike and Throwing Knives, for example, let's just tag those two, I can get either the top half of Flanking Strike, attack for three, add plus two attack, and gain an experience whenever the target is adjacent to one of your allies, or I can take move five from Flanking Strike. And whichever I don't take from Flanking Strike, I take that one with the Throwing Knives. So if I take five movement on the Flanking Strike, then the Throwing Knives will give me exclusively the attack for two on range three, you target two enemies and gain an EXP. I think that's probably like the most concise description that I can give before I should really just start launching in. So Cragheart probably wants to go up in this direction and punish one of these. Does Cragheart want to do that? Maybe I put Cragheart in the wrong position. Maybe Cragheart should st be staying all the way back here. Just because the Living Corpse up here has base stats of 5 HP, 1 movement, and 3 attack, plus no range. So that corpse is going to have to take a while to come over here and actually fight us. So if I want to bait it towards me, I don't have to spend my actions moving up towards it in order to hit it. All right. The Cultist Elite has 2 movement. No range implied on the card, though. All right, fair enough. We can also see those attack modifiers. The attack modifiers directly in the monster card show the likeliness that they will roll one of those different effects. So, for instance, if they roll the zero with the strike through it, the leftmost symbol available there, I'd hover over it if I could, but... I, oh, hang on. I kind of can here. Just, just there. Just there. Uh, if they roll that, they are going to deal no damage with their attack whatsoever. It's like a zero point times multiplier. If they roll negative two, they do negative two attack, negative one, negative one, and you can kind of see how it would proceed from there. It effectively gives you the likelihood that they crit or get something that would be antithetical to a crit. Okay. Where do I actually want to put Crackheart? So we've got a lot of abilities for each of these characters. Uh, I should probably just quickly go over some of the abilities these characters have. Unstable Upheaval allows you to attack three, targeting all adjacent enemies. If you have channels the nature recently, I don't know if it's necessarily called nature in this, but I'm going to say nature or leaf. If you've channeled leaf recently, instead it will target enemies up to two hexes away. All adjacent allies will also take damage and you get an EXP. You can also see in the bottom right of this card, a little burning symbol and that means if I use that effect of the card I will burn the card. Cards are the most important resource for you in this game. I know I'm doing a lot of tutorializing but please bear with me there is a lot to explain. The ball gets rolling pretty quickly though. So cards are effectively your entire resource in this game. As you burn cards you have fewer actions you're capable of doing. As you play cards that don't burn so they just discard you can see there's no burning effect in the bottom right on either of these they just get discarded discarded cards can be brought back by long resting which allows you to heal up a little bit as well as refresh all of your spent item cards and choose only one discarded card out of all of your cards discarded to lose and get all of the others back so obviously if in order to get your discarded cards back you have to lose one of your cards that is to say burn it you are going to be losing cards over the course of the fight right you're going to be burning cards naturally as you're using them you're going to be burning cards to get other cards back from the discard pile as you if you run out of cards your character dies so managing those resources is incredibly important so this isn't a situation where i can take a billion years to fight all of these enemies because i have to play two cards every single turn so it kind of enforces more proactive gameplay in that fashion all right, so I probably want to move Cragheart 3. No, do I want to move up in that direction? I thought I decided ultimately I didn't. Let's decide the Scoundrel's turn because that's going to be a lot more straightforward. So the Scoundrel currently has two moves, tags, flanking strike and the drawing knives. Yeah, no, I wasn't necessarily actually going to be doing those. Okay, so I could go for Thieves' Knack, which has an attack on its bottom half, as well as a quick hands so you can see thieves knack first quick hands second i have 23 as my priority 
So I can use quick hands to move and then attack this bone ra uh, ranger. And then I can use the thieves knack to attack again just to finish it off. I'm also making sure that I don't use cards that burn on their effect right now because I don't want to use all of those right now. I feel like Cragheart can probably spend a turn just upgrading, getting ready. So I am going to use backup ammunition. On the next four ranged attacks, add an extra target. So that seems like that's going to be pretty useful for me. And I'll probably also want to move two off to the left. So I'm going to go back up and Dirt Tornado. So I'm choosing Dirt Tornado just because I don't care about its effect. I don't want to use that in this combat. So sometimes you will effectively just be using trash cards so that you don't use your better cards before you want to. All right, so I'll end my selection. So we can see the Bone Ranger has rolled Heal 1, Target 2, and Attack for 1 at Range 2 against two targets. So the Bone Ranger hopefully isn't going to just deal a bunch of damage to us. It's got range two, right? So yeah, it should only be able to hit the scoundrel. The cultist elite moves one, attacks two, and heals for one on itself, and the living corpse can only move two and attack two. Beautiful. So we can see them slot into the priority order. Obviously, we have our thief up first, who'll move up in this direction. You can see I've activated quick hands there, and I'm completing the order of the card from top to bottom, right? So I move two, then I attack two. Great. Now, Quick Hands is done. And then I will use the Thieves' Knack. So you can see I couldn't have used the top part. It was grayed out there. All right. Scoundrel gets to end the turn. So I just straight up stole a turn from my enemy by killing it before it had anything it could do there. Lovely. So thankfully, despite the fact that this enemy is going to be able to move two spaces, I'm still going to get a far better turn. And that is based around the fact that I get to move later than them, so they don't even have the ability to move to and then attack me there. They're also typically quite slow, so I should be able to move faster than them in the next combat. Uh, next combat round, that is. Okay. Ooh, no! No! I didn't want to skip my movement! Dang it! Sorry, I, w I was trying to get ready to move up and behind the monster. That's okay, it... It's not that bad. If you end your turn on top of one of the gold spaces, you can see, then you get to pick up that gold. Because action economy is so incredibly important, because your actions are effectively your life, because that's true, you can't necessarily always afford to go and pick up all of the gold in every location. So we can see this cultist elite is out here adjacent to none of its allies. So that gives me an idea for the Scoundrel. The Scoundrel has an attack that does extra damage if the target is adjacent to none of its allies, which is currently true. So I am going to one, two... How many spaces do I have to move? One, two, three... Okay, yeah, very few spaces. I'm totally fine here. So I am going to backstab and venom shiv here. Venom shiv? Sorry, special mixture. Then back over to Cragheart. Now, Cragheart has extra damage, uh, extra targeting on ranged abilities. So I want to use a ranged ability like Crater. A lot of damage at three range. But I'm more than three away from the Cultist Elite at the moment. So I'm going to have to move a little over to do that. Okay, so I'll use a Rumbling Advance just so that I do it relatively early. And then Crater. Okay, so the cult uh, the moving corpse, living corpse rather, now gets to move one this turn. So if I end up two spaces away from the living corpse before I do anything, we're in a great position. Now I'm going to move three and then poison an adjacent enemy. Uh, I will be entirely honest. I do not entirely remember what the poison effect does. I think it amplifies damage dealt to that target. And I think bleed is like the DOT. So I don't think poison is the DOT in this game. Uh, then I'm going to backstab. You can see that it is modified. I've got three attack and plus two for the fact that it's not near an ally. I think the final plus one is because of the poison effect. Ooh, and I rolled a plus one on the die. So I actually just straight up killed it. insta the enemy. Beautiful. Okay. Well, that makes my whole crater turn a lot less impactful. Grumble, grumble. 
I'm actually going to move up closer just so that I'm moving further towards the door to go to the next area as quickly as possible so that I'm not wasting actions. Uh, but also... But also to collect that gold. So I'll confirm my movement here. Great. Now you can see I use an effect that channels nature or leaf. However... I'm not going to be able to capitalize on it. So down next to a leaf is utilize your stored channels, nature or leaf, right? In this circumstance. Um, I'm not actually going to be able to do that, uh, that in this circumstance. You can't channel it and use it in the same turn. Roll a plus one. Rolled a negative one instead. That's real bad. All right. So that just means that I'm going to get hit. Yeah. So... As damage is dealt to your character, you have the ability to burn available cards. Obviously, really, really tragic to have to do. Burn discarded cards, so you have fewer cards come back after you take a long rest or a short rest even. And you can just straight up receive damage. I'm going to elect to receive damage because it's really important that I manage my cards correctly. It's really interesting the way that cards are tied into the action economy as well as into your character's life and ability set. It's... It's like combining a lot of different mechanics into one overall card management. And of course, if there's anything I love, you gotta know it's that card management. Okay. So I'm probably gonna leave Cragheart here to finish out that enemy by itself. On the next four attacks targeting enemies adjacent to none of their allies gain plus two attack. So I'm gonna wanna set up single out for myself at the moment and smoke bomb so i'm just gonna get the scoundrel ultra buffed so that i can run into the next room and insta jib an enemy Cragheart here all right so Cragheart obviously wants to move two around to the other side and then kill this enemy so yeah let's use a card that i don't really care about so crushing grass is gonna be my kill and then earthen clawed i don't really have much healing to do at the moment so i'll throw that away as my movement Ooh, okay, so it's got four attack if you're next to it for too long. That could be bad. So yeah, you can see I'm actually burning the smoke bomb here as well as the single out. I'm totally comfortable doing that. Okay. So because it's heal two and range three, I'll move around myself. I suspect it's possible this game is a little bit quieter than I am intending it to be. So I'm going to pop it just a little bit up. There we go. Get a little bit more of that spooky atmosphere going on. So I'm going to turn around and punch and immobilize. A lot of these, like, you're not necessarily going to need a tooltip. You know what immobilize means. It means what it means. So you can see at the end of the round, I get to pick up that gold. End the whole round. And now, scoundrel. I'm going to want you to run into the other room and just insta-kill someone if you can, please. So, Flanking Strike or Venom Shiv are going to be the things that I want to use here. I trigger Venom Shiv first because I want all of the enemies in the room I'm about to go into to have already moved by the time I get in there. feel like I may end up using Massive Boulder, so if I have a larger move... Oh, I do. Oh, not a good earlier move. Damn. So Massive Boulder is currently my best move. That's that's unfortunate. Alright, I'm going to use Rock Tunnel and Massive Boulder. In the other order. Yeah. So this gives Cragheart the ability to go after... My rogue, so my rogue is invisibly going to go into a new room and scout it out for me effectively. So we can see the open door. Beautiful. Heck of a lot of enemies in here. A lot of them are actually quite powerful. Okay, so four. So I'm just trying to figure out Cragheart's turn as well. So one, two, three, four. You'll move to here and then you'll throw rocks at each of those characters. That sounds good. So that means that I should move up up here or just here. Let's undo the waypoints. Just go here. Confirm my movement. And then Venom Shiv. So I skip the rest of my movement there. 
and then venom shoot this enemy you can also see i'm getting experience out of this which is neat great just got to completely insensitive as i walked in i lose my invisibility unfortunately it's also really unfortunate but some of the other enemies had their abilities to take their turns slightly after me slightly after what no slightly before I guess they weren't engaged yet, so that means they inserted themselves into the turn order. Yeah, that makes sense. Unfortunate, but it does make sense. Alright. So they're all moving and trying to heal themselves a little. That's not really going to bring you much. Somehow, I've got that inkling. Okay. So... This is a jump movement, which means I have the ability to use this movement to go through obstacles as well as go through traps, go through enemies, any of those kinds of things, as long as I land in a legal space. I'm just using it so that I can move as far as possible right now, though. Okay. That's where I want to go. That's the jump animation you've just seen there. And then I will... One, two, three. Yeah. I'll skip the rest of the movement, throw one massive boulder at each of these two targets. I think I just have to target the aggressive ones. Yep. Dealt four damage there, one in AoE, so I actually got one on the cultist as well. And only three there, unfortunately. Okay, so that Bone Ranger is still going to be active in the next turn. So end my turn, end the round, get back to Crackheart. You can see now the problem, right? I have three choices that I can make at this point in time, and none of them necessarily good. And a lot of these are cards that will burn if I use their effects. I think I probably want to have the Scoundrel take care- Oh, hang on. Scoundrel's gonna have a little bit of difficulty with that. Okay, so the Scoundrel is going to use a short rest, which discards a... Sorry, which burns a discarded card at random in order to recover all of the others. This can be done during a turn, though. So I lose Flanking Strike, which is fine. I get the rest of my cards back. Okay, so now I should have the ability to... Yeah, I can move two and then attack one. That gives me the ability to move up two, just attack that enemy, and then I can start focusing in a different direction. Yep. It's... It's throwing knives quick hands. Because if I do that, then I can throw a knife at each of the remaining cultists on the field. Alright, Cragheart. Yours is a little bit more difficult. I, I guess you should just select two cards. Just two cards, any cards. And then use the generic effects instead. Okay. Oh. I'm dumb. Oh, that makes sense. That must be why I do all of those dumb things. Yeah, I, I, uh, I batted. I, I did bad on that. That was not good. All right, let's undo. So instead, I'll take the generic quick hands moving action. So I'll move directly up one, which should give me access with throwing knives to each of the other targets. Yep. That'll still do it. Beauty and grace, get the hell out my face. I... So these two enemies up here aren't real concerns to me right now. I definitely can't hit them. So do I actually want to do anything this turn? Yeah, I should probably still move up in their general direction. Oh, accidentally skipped my movement there as well. Yeah, I need to stop play, uh, pressing the skip button when I intend to not press the skip button. Sounds like a good idea for me. Mm-hmm. So you can see, actually, up here, there's some loot that I'd really like to have. Hmm. Not 
sure if I can really take advantage of that. All right, let's go for a short rest. And yeah, I have to burn Crater, but that's okay. Crater is like huge. I really, really would have liked to keep Crater. Dirt Tornado into Massive Boulder would give me the ability to move up three and then probably target each of the enemies, no matter where they ended up. So I do have the ability to get back throwing knives later and then use its loot two. So loot two effectively describes the radius, right? You loot all coins that are up to two spaces away from you. And those are contiguous spaces. So you can't have it be spaces through objects or anything like that. So for instance, if the scoundrel stood here and did the loot two, that would work. I'm gonna move to and just poison this enemy. It's fine. Cultist stuff is too damaged. What? Summon living bones. Oh, damn. That's not gonna be good for me. Alright, fine. Move up. Skip the rest of the movement. Poison the enemy adjacent. Throw out an attack that'll kill it. Oh, 12 damage. Yeah, that, that'll, that'll get it done, I think. We'll need to um and or ah uh about that one. Okay. Then this one is just make sure that I don't waypoint into danger. Up there, and then massive boulder to fire at each of you. If this does plus one, no, it didn't. Damn. Okay, so the living bones is not going to die here. But you can see that we've almost killed all of the enemies in all rooms. So we know that this is probably our final room. I say probably. It's definitely our final room. Okay. First things first. The scoundrel has to loot. Okay. I'm fine with burning that. So I really want the scoundrel to go all the way up here. One... Two, three, four, five, six. It's six away. Yeah, I don't have the ability to move six. Oh, unless I quick hands as well as... Yeah, okay. So I've got to make sure that Cragheart goes slower than 60. I think. Actually, no. Maybe I don't need to make sure of that. Yeah, maybe it's okay if Cragheart kills earlier. I think, it'd be, uh, I think in fact it will be. So let's use that earthen clod and then like any movement effectively. Okay, so earthen clod has the range that I'm looking for here. Take out the final target. Popped him. Great. And then, yeah, you don't really want to make anything there. Uh, yeah, I'll just walk through that trap. That's fine. So I'll take two damage, but we're about to leave the dungeon anyway, so it's not really going to be a concern for me, I don't believe. End my turn on the top of gold. And then I will have my scoundrel move all the way up here. Use quick hands effectively as a glorified moving action to confirm movement there. Skip the movement, skip the attack. But I get to loot. I get 10 gold. Okay. I was hoping I was going to get an item from that. So I end my round. The round that you end after all enemies are dead is just you leaving the dungeon. So you can't just loot all the rest of the stuff. And I will finish there. All right, cool. So that is just effectively like a pit stop on our way to the actual target, the burnt tavern down here. So let's travel. The remains of an old tavern stand testament to happier times. Raids by bandits and sightings of unmentionable creatures from the petrified forest to the south drove away the owners in recent years. The sign, the happy hearth, creaks forlornly in the breeze. Alright, so we've completed our journey down here, actually without 
much of a problem. We gain four gold, five EXP, and an item, the Boots of Dashing. During your movement, add three move to a single movement. I haven't actually been utilizing any items so far. I will try and focus that on that a little bit more in the next episode. So we'll leave the Burn Tavern, and now we have the ability to choose other locations to go to. Uh, it looks like I can just go back towards Wayward. So could I just run back and forth between the two towns and just farm out there? I think, in fact, that I might be able to do. Thankfully, I'm not going to have to do so much tutorialization in the next episode. So there will be far more gameplay. My apologies on that front. But now you're basically caught up to where I am with the rule set. I will also mention at the very end here the rest of the selling points for this game in particular again back to what can be considered advertising content new features will be included over the course of the development of the game including cooperative play as well as modding uh, there are no dates for those yet available over the course of early access they will be adding new enemies bosses biomes characters items abilities and features there are also only a limited number of enemies, bosses, items, zones, biomes available in the digital exclusive roguelike mode. At the launch of early access, only four of the 17 mercenaries will be available. We've mentioned that before. And I think that is it. The early access period in particular is important to Asmodee Digital as it is a time for them to build the game with the community, adding in features, content, and developing the game alongside their players for the moment my name is Ben Rhapsody the name of the game has been Gloomhaven there is a link in the description down below to purchase the game it is now available on Steam hopefully you've been enjoying yourselves and hopefully we'll see you next time